absolute first derby con and i'm having a great time and more importantly yeah, uh, the sponsors actually let me come up the organizers let me come up here and talk in front of y'all for a few minutes about what can be a very touchy subject patriotism uh, and speaking of touchy subjects, my lawyers are very touchy also and wanted to make sure that I give the standard disclaimer. So everything I'm about to say are just my ideas and I have no way, shape or form any way reflect the official policy of my employer or my employer's employers. So I'm going to talk a little background today, uh, provide a use case and then take any questions. And like everybody else today, it seems in this room, this talk started as an hour long talk. So I've nugged it down to fit within the, the 25 minutes. So if there seem to be any abrupt jumps in the reasoning, I'd love to talk with you outside uh, afterwards. So I'm a scientist. So I start with a hypothesis. And here's my hypothesis today. Uh, to spark conversation, I think, on a very needed topic. And that is, I completely believe that the United States government cannot defend the nation and its citizens in the digital domain. And I believe this is a significant problem. And so, therefore, we should be exploring what capabilities private citizens and corporations should be allowed to employ for themselves, which means we have to evolve our mindset over the next year or so to figure out what capabilities private industry should be allowed to protect themselves more robustly until the government can do their job. So today, I'm not going to talk about being pirates, but being patriots and how it's in our bloodline to be able to hack back. So life used to be a lot less complicated. If someone wanted to hurt you, they had to get pretty close to you. And then we developed the repeating rifle and someone could be hiding on a ridge line 100 yards away. And then we figured out bombs and missiles and drones. And now they could be a continent away and harm you. And more importantly today, we have ones and zeros that can damage your way of life and they could be a world away when they attack you. And so normally as each wave of disruptive technology was imagined, our laws eventually catch up uh, with the crime and our defensive forces are eventually resourced to be able to regulate and counter. So in the words of our greatest wartime president, Abraham Lincoln, as our case is anew, so we have to think and act anew. But I say, hold, hold a second. We don't really have to think of anything new. We can just resurrect older regulations and concepts that are still on the books. Uh, and just go back to the future to make them happen. So if we hop in the way back machine, right, to 1787 when our founding fathers were drafting the Constitution. So our founding fathers were a really revolutionary group. Uh, they were diverse in their professions, and yet they were unified in a common goal of American liberty. So they saw America as the land of freedom and opportunity with minimal government intrusion and a very limited federal government whose main goal in life was to protect the people and create a safe environment for them to pursue happiness. And so having just defeated a centralized tyranny in the Revolutionary War, they were very careful about what powers they gave the federal government to do those two things, protect the people and maintain a safe environment for them. So in Article 1, Section A of the Constitution, this is what made the final cut as being so important. And so the Founding Fathers deliberated extensively to come up with a document that could adapt and grow as times went along to tackle issues, technologies, and ways of life that they couldn't possibly imagine. So what are these letters that, that the Constitution refers to? Uh, well, they're a way that a nation can redress the injuries of its citizens without the need to go to full-scale war. And over the years, these terms have become interchangeable, and sometimes we use them together. But when Europe started using them in the 1300s, uh, they had nuances and differences. So first, you have letters of reprisal. So these were self-help remedies for merchants that were injured by foreign parties. So basically, they were issued in a time of peace, which is where we are right now today, right? Uh, to allow the bearer to seize property belonging to individuals from a foreign nation in recompense for their injuries. On the other hand, these letters of marquee or mark, depending on the correct pronunciation of them, we can argue that for an hour to start with, uh, were issued during a time of war authorizing captains to prey on enemy sh vessels in international waters. But regardless, both of them enabled private entities to be an agent for the government, to right a wrong either done to them or to the nation from a foreign actor or a nation state. So if you think about it, back to the 1770s, our nation was faced with a monstrous foe, Great Britain. It was the empire that the sun never set on. 
They were a powerhouse not only in the military sense, both on land and on sea, but also in the economic sense. They ruled the world. And we were merely a fledgling collection of states that we were trying to figure out how we were going to prepare to fight on both land and sea against a resourced enemy that felt they could just do whatever they wanted to do. And so George Washington, recognizing that we lack the time and resources to develop a standing army and a standing navy to fight for our independence, turned to its citizens, to our patriots. And so these were men and women that set aside their normal life activities, their nine to five job, to defend the nation and its people. They were faced with corruption and thieving and a malicious intent from an enemy that did not respect the hard work that we had put into constructing our way of life. And so they took up arms to defend the nation. And it's the same thing we face today. I mean, we're faced with resourced enemies that don't respect our laws, don't respect our privacy or our property, and the government's just not resourced to defend us. And so I can go real a lot further in the history lesson, but due to time, there's only one thing you have to take away from it, and that is, as a nation, and even as a larger international community, we have long provided that there's separate rules for when we fight on land and when we fight on sea, uh, because we have different objectives. And so I'm contending that conflict in the digital domain maps to conflict on the open sea, and therefore we can use the same legal constructs. So let me explain. Naval domain fighting in the 1800s, digital domain fighting today. So in both, uh, the attacker bears very little personal risk, right? From a privateer perspective, the letters allowed them to go after any vessel that was flying a certain flag. So they could choose who they wanted to go against, right? So they're going to weigh the amount of cool cargo on the vessel and how much armament that convoy has before they make that decision to get the best rate of return. And for the bulk of the crew, they didn't have any personal resources tied into whether the mission was successful or not. So it was minimal risk for them. And so from today's perspective, an offensive operator or a patriot is going to be executing his hunt from or her hunt from continents away and therefore not closing in with the enemy and going to be physically harmed. Well, I mean, maybe eventually a carpal tunnel syndrome, depending on how good and how long they work. And in both, you can um, impose significant economic harm without civilian deaths. So due to the built-in constraints and legalities of the privateering system, which I'll talk about in a minute, the system encouraged the protection of civilians because the target was to s disrupt the economy, not other people. Same thing today. And additionally, in both, it's hard to tell the difference between a military and a civilian target or an infrastructure, right? Because a ship flying a British flag then could be a merchant with trade goods for the Orient, or they could be a resupply for the English troops at Bunker Hill. You had to board the vessel to figure out how it was going to be able to be used. And that's why in conflict on the sea, targets were divided into permissible things and impermissible things, because you could not divide them into military versus civilian targets. And it's the same thing for today's patriots, right? A Cisco router or a Linux machine, well, it could be a private company's or it could be a military target, and you don't know until um, you actually touch it. And in both situations, though, you really don't want to engage military targets, right? From a privateer perspective, you're a merchant ship. Okay, heavily armed merchant ship. Why in the world would you go against a line of battle British ship, right? Not only would they have just about no cargo that was worth anything, but they were so heavily armed that they were going to kick your butt. So there was no purpose. And it's the same with uh, today. It would be silly to go against military targets um, in this construct. And finally, in both, the U.S. forces just aren't currently capable of defending the nation and by extension its citizens at the moment. There's a great pool of trained folks both in the civilian community and the military community, but the government's still trying to gather the resources required to man, train, and equip a standing force. And, you know, unfortunately, the enemy is not going to wait or pause its actions until we're ready. We can't just tell the world, stop touching us until we're ready to defend the nation, and then you can start. Uh, so we have to figure out something as a stopgap measure. And so history tells us that privateering and using these letters was quite commonplace. Uh, European, un uh, European nations used this model for centuries. And more importantly for us today, it would grant us the time to build our capabilities within the United States government without completely ceding the battlefield in the meantime. So the use of privateers uh, also provides the nation a strategic advantage as it's a way to inflict harm on a foreign entity without going to full-out war. So how we would do it? 
I shall show you. Um, so first we start with the players. So who are the players of this construct? Well, the first is the privateer, right? So historically, this was an armed vessel owned, outfitted, and manned by private parties, not related to the federal government, with a commission to act from the government. So today, uh, our crew of our ship would be a crackerjack group of private individuals with the required technical skills to conduct search and acquire missions within the digital domain. Then we come up to the promoter of the venture. So these were the owners of the vessels that also financed the entire thing. So today, this could be a company that was attacked by a foreign entity. They would finance the entire reprisal operation. And I mean, if they were a large corporation, maybe they have these Cracker Jacks already on staff. Or if they're a smaller corporation, they could contract them out. And this is the same thing that used to happen in historic times also. Then you come to who's supposed to be issuing these letters. Well, the Constitution clearly states that Congress has the sole right to issue letters today. And then you come up with the Admiralty Court. So this was the prize court. So this was the federal court that once you went out and you did your mission, you had to bring the bounty home to so that way they could certify that everything you did on the cruise was in compliance with the letter. And today, U.S. federal statutes name the federal district court as this entity. So this was... Uh, last debated back in the early 1900s, and so it's the federal district court for us today. So now that I've identified the players, we'll lay out the game. And so I'm going to be talking about letters of reprisal, because unless Congress declared war this morning and I wasn't paying attention because I was listening to DerbyCon talks, uh, I'm assuming we're still at peace with the rest of the world. So I'm just talking about letters of reprisal. So first you have to prove that you've been wronged to the federal district court. So you introduce some evidence and you provide some sense of attribution on, on who performed the damage to you and your corporation. And you talk a little bit about the scope or extent of the damage that was, um, that you received. And so I completely get it. Attribution is really difficult. And if we start talking about APTs, it gets even more difficult. But the thing is, is that there's a lot of attacks. That that's just totally not the case. I mean, picture yourself as Land Rover two years ago, they were able to attribute beyond the shadow of a legal doubt uh, that a Chinese auto manufacturing company stole their intellectual property, which caused them significant economic harm. So if this construct had been in place back then, uh, they could have approached the modern day version of this admiralty court to request a letter of reprisal. So kind of update it and put it in your head. Picture an episode of Judge Judy, right? And that's kind of what the plaintiff provides is what you'd have to provide to the federal district court. But unlike, you know, Judge Judy, where she hears two amazing cases in merely a 30-minute window and makes the final decision on who's guilty and who's not, in this case, the federal district court hears all the facts of the case and then would pass a recommendation to Congress or a subcommittee of Congress saying whether or not the facts of the case supported the issuance of a letter. And that's because, well... You're getting a letter because it was a foreign actor that did this to you. And so the idea is, is that Congress should be able to take a strategic view and decide if there's other foreign policy concerns or constraints about not wanting to issue a letter. Um, at least that's what they're supposed to be doing, right? Keeping track of the strategic environment. So if you can prove that you were wronged and who wronged you, and so let's say that Congress gives you a letter of reprisal. So the real economic damage to Land Rover um, can you guess which is the real Land Rover and which is the knockoff version? Uh, it wasn't the loss of sales, right? Because true believers will understand this is merely a knockoff. Uh, but the big damage came from the dilution of its trademark and design and all the R&D they put into this car. So you get the letter and it goes to the captain of the team. So this is the CEO of the wronged company. And so the letter comes with certain requirements and bounds. This is not just a free-for-all to do what you will uh, against this other auto manufacturer. Uh, there's constraints that are built in. And so letters started with a bunch of standard constraints and then some specific ones. Uh, but the first two big things were what you were not allowed to do. And this has been in every letter that the United States government has ever issued in its lifetime. And the first is you can't suppress or distort evidence that you found when you board the vessel. Well, that makes sense, right? Something to definitely keep for our modern day reinterpretation. Basically, you just can't falsify the information or the action logs of how your operation took place or what you found. And needless to say, you have to keep very good records as you go along so you can later prove exactly what you did and what you targeted in your operation. The second thing you weren't allowed to do is you weren't allowed to embezzle cargo. Also very solid. 
Basically, you were required to present to the court at the end of the operation with a true accounting of all property, in this case both intellectual and monetary, that you recovered or seized during your operation. I mean, you're already being allowed to do really cool stuff, so why would you lie about what you actually found? Uh, next, you had to bring, once the operation was done, every, all the prizes to the proper court for adjudication which basically means you'd go back to the federal district court to validate your actions and the scope of the prize and what you did. And of course, you were always required to protect neutral rights during the operation. So you couldn't go attacking neutral parties, which in the equivalent of military operations is we don't go out and start attacking the Red Cross. There was also limitations placed on the captain of what was a permissible target at the start of the operation. So basically, this will tell you the scope of who you could recoup your losses from. And then it also talked about the prize sums, so how it would be divided between the owners and the crew. And this was to ensure that all promises of prize money were duly recorded before the adventure began so that way no one got cheated out of their fair share. And I think it's a good thing to keep in our modern day letters to protect our Cracker Jack team. And they also said what you were allowed to take. And then finally, all letters had an expiration date. It wasn't an open-ended thing. You would have so many days in order to um, execute your operation. So this is all the sorts of information that would be in your letter. Who's allowed to do it, what you're allowed to do, and how much you can take. For instance, if you received a letter of reprisal uh, that a specific threat entity caused you $10 million in damage, you'd be constrained to something along the same order of magnitude to steal back. In, to recoup your losses, and you would not be allowed to go try to take $100 million from that, that company. Um, these letters, which authorized actions at your own expense, in essence made you an agent of the government when you were doing the actions in accordance with the scope of the letter. And so therefore, you would be protected from being arrested or extradited to a foreign nation for the results of these operations. As long as you stayed in bound to the letter, you were protected. So in order to receive this letter, right, so Congress decides, the federal court says, okay, we agree, you got, you definitely need a letter, you got your stuff stolen. Um, and they decide, here's the bounds of your letter. But before you can start the operation, you had to put up a bond. And so that bond would cover the estimated cost of damages that you might ensue if the operation goes outside the scope of the letter. So you post a bond, not a James Bond, but a bond to make sure that you don't turn pirate. And you know, there's some math out there that could help develop what a good bond for a specific hacking operation would be. But once you have the bond in place, uh, then the operation can begin. So going back to the Land Rover example, just purely fictional, um, Land Rovers is a really large company with an excellent IT staff, but uh, they weren't really trained in offensive operations. So they subcontracted it out to a team of Cracker Jacks from a private company. And so when the CEO was granted a letter against JMC, it listed Land Rovers, the wronged party, <clears throat> and it listed who they'd subcontracted with. And this was to make sure of the credentials of the individuals that were doing the work, because it's not just any Tom, Dick, or Harry. You don't want them just mucking around. You wanted professionals to do it. So historically, once the operation is done, so you go do the operation, you bring your booty back to the federal district court, and that's when the adjudication starts. And so back in the day, it started with a public announcement, so that way everybody that wanted to attend could. And basically, what the U.S. always did in our use of letters of reprisal was we did a trial by jury. And the whole purpose of that trial when it came back was to make sure that the captured vessel and goods were within scope of the letter and that the crew absolutely conducted operations within the bounds of the letter. That's all they were validating. So back to the Land Rover example, right? So they've completed their operation, and now they have to explain what they did. So the, their, that team of Cracker Jacks was able to infiltrate the CEO of JMC's computer due to poor password management, because that's the easiest way. So it turns out the CEO had bought a new toaster, which connects to your home Wi-Fi to pull the weather report for the day, and then sears that into your morning toast. This is indeed a true product on the market today. Well, it turns out um, there's flaws in the code. Well, it's fictional, right? I don't know if there's actually flaws in the code, but, you know, let's just pretend there are. And it allowed the Land Rover team into his home Wi-Fi because, of course, he uses the same credentials at home as he does for his business computer and so on and so on and so on. And we can all see what's going to happen at this point. And the net result is they were able to transfer $300 million to an offshore banking account. And they caused no permanent physical damage to any device.
device or any person throughout the, the operation. So the CEO of Land Rover and his chief of his Cracker Jacks come to back to the federal district court. They lay out everything they did, how they did it, uh, the amount of money they'd captured. And of course, luckily for them, the court agrees. Everything was done within bounds of the, the letter. And now they were able to transfer that $300 million to their own account. So in essence, the prize court uh, controlled the income of the pi privateers. Uh, they only made money if you snagged prizes off the high seas within the bounds of the charter and bring it safely back to port. So once Land Rover pays whatever court costs and lawyer fees are associated with the action, they divide up the remainder of the money in accordance with the letter between the team of Cracker Jacks and the company. So what happens if the court finds that the operation was totally illegit and it was outside the bounds of the letter as written? Well, first there was the bond, right? The big bond that they put up. So if someone uh, comes forward and says that they were grievously harmed because of the mission, well, then they could petition the federal district court and they could receive a portion of that bond. But if the operation is considered uh, outside the scope of the issued letter, uh, then the government could effectively rescind the protections of the letter, and therefore that foreign entity uh, can pursue criminal charges on the captain and crew in accordance with their laws. And well, if we had an extradition treaty with them, well, I hope you enjoy your new jail cell. So three big questions, very briefly. Uh, the first big question is, did it really work? When private citizens and patriots focus on disrupting the economies of foreign entities that had done harm to U.S. citizens, did it really stop them from doing it again? Well, most historians say yes, um, but there's no real limited ability to actually prove it because most of the records are gone. The next question is, does Congress still have the power to issue these? And well, even though Congress hasn't exercised this power in almost 200 years, the courts will likely find that Congress still indeed has it because the clause is still in our Constitution. And more importantly, we've never signed or ratified any international agreements to include the Declaration of Paris of 1865 to give up that right. So offline, we can talk lots about international law um, if you'd like to. And is there really a need to be able to use them? Well, I say there kind of is, right? We're sure not going to declare war with North Korea because Sony lost some property. I mean, so many other their actions in the last decades have not propelled us to declare war with them. And, you know, we should have an ability for a lesser response. I mean, other than parking a nuclear submarine off their coast or landing army troops on their ground, we should have something to respond to them when foreign actors attack our citizens and our way of life. Because, you know, if your house is broken into today, you could call the police and they would do something about it. If your server's broken into tomorrow and your intellectual property is stolen, our government says, tough luck. You should have had better protection on it. Because the government's not resourced to be able to defend you. So we can either wait till they're resourced, or we can do something now to hold the tide. The hacking of corporations in cyberspace will not stop until hostile states and foreign actors are forced to reconsider the cost of their actions. Our government should be defending its citizens and our right to happiness in a more perfect union and using patriots as a time-honored way to do that. So back to my hypothesis to start it all, the United States government can't provide protection or defend its citizens in the digital domain today. And therefore, we should be having a meaningful conversation as a nation to talk about what capabilities we should allow private citizens or private corporations to have. And many people think 